Good. Good morning, and welcome to this webinar about GDPR and also PECR and data management in general in compliance with the new and incoming regulations. Um, I'm Tim Rose, the editor of AM, and I'm hosting and chairing the webinar. And with me is today's presenter, Steve Yeur from eDynamics. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. In a moment, Steve will begin his presentation, which I hope will be thought-provoking and um, give you plenty um, of food for thought and give you plenty of opportunities to give give us some questions. Because as the audience, you can get involved. You've joined in a listen-only mode. However, you will have a dialogue box on your screen, which you can type into. And we encourage you to please do take part type in your questions, your comments, even challenge what you'll, you'll hear if you wish while the webinar is live. We'll allow probably about 20 minutes or so after Steve's presentation for, for the Q&A part of this presentation. And so I'll be putting your questions to Steve then. So Steve, over to you now. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. I just want to say thank you for joining the webinar. Um, we, you'll notice on your control panel there are some handouts, uh, there's three in total. Um, I'll talk you through those but uh, at various points, but they are there for you to take away. Uh, I'll be referencing the contents of those handouts uh, throughout. Um, and you know, a lot of research I've done over the past few months, uh, I've ended up with probably just a couple of documents that I refer to all of the time. So um, yeah, they're there for you. There's also a copy of the slides we're going to take you through uh, so you can take those away as well. Okay, so without further ado, we'll begin talking through. So the agenda for the webinar itself is to uh, give you a brief history about us, talk a little about the, data, the history of data protection, but then really get into um, what have been, I think, the difficult elements of impl impl uh, implementing GDPR. Um, direct marketing is one that keeps coming up, uh, and we will we'll focus on direct marketing a lot, uh, especially as we're now very, you know, right on top of, uh, of D-Day, as it were. Um, there's other things like, you know, around consent, uh, legitimate interest. Opt-out is a big one that not many people are talking about. Um, the management information is, again, it's not something that people are talking about too much, and also um, compliance management. And I will touch on our own um, particular solution, which is called iConsent, right at the very end. But you, you'll see little bits and pieces that um, iConsent has already given us in terms of intelligence, uh, stats, some really good data that just isn't doing the rounds just yet. Um, so that's kind of the agenda for what we want to talk through today. A little bit on who we are, first of all. So we are a company that was formed in 2010. Um, the, the team has uh, a lot of experience. Um, what we essentially are right now is an after-sales solution, a single sign-on after-sales solution, providing things like service plans, vehicle health check, um, CRM follow-up, so you know, service reminders, um, follow-up of Amber work, um, surveys, all those type of things. Um, what this has meant for us uh, is that we are a um, heavily involved in GDPR as a data processor. Most of you listening are probably data controllers, but you know, there may be some processors listening as well. Um, so the, the viewpoint you're going to hear today is actually from not just us, us as a processor, but we've had, because we're jointly responsible now on the GDPR with everything that can, our dealers that use our um, particular software send out, especially via follow-up. Um, yeah, the CRM module is the most impacted upon by GDPR. That's not to say you look at the other elements like service plans and VHC aren't. Um, they do, there are elements of GDPR that apply to those as well, but direct marketing for certain is the one that's really been heavily hit by um, the amount of work we've had to put in to make sure we're compliant, not just ourselves, but the dealers as well. So that's us in a nutshell. Um, me, myself, I've, I've worked in dealers all my life. Um, I've been in the motor industry over 20 years. Uh, I've watched um, the World Wide Web and the internet take hold of what we do in, 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 in the day-to-day -day activities in the dealers. Um, and it's been really interesting getting to this point um, to see exactly you know, how things are moving on and how the world is changing you know, and what that means for the motor industry. So that's me as well. Now, 
just lastly, our, in terms of ourselves, uh, we are um, ISO 27001 accredited, which is uh, at this moment in time the highest um, possible accreditation anywhere any business can have in terms of data protection. There are going to be some um, GDPR certifications coming through. I'm, I'm well aware of that happening at some probably next year, uh, and we will be looking to achieve those as well. But we're also a member of the DMA, and we've done a lot of um, conversing with the DMA over the last, over recent months over exactly what needs to be in place to make sure that you know direct marketing can can continue to happen uh, from the 25th onwards. So that that's us. That's what we, you know where we're coming from in terms of uh, GDPR. So. I just want to rewind a little bit first uh, and talk through the history of data protection because there's some things that don't get talked about when we're talking when we're you know discussing GDPR that I feel are relevant. Um, roughly 20 years ago, just a little bit over that, in around 1995, the, the World Wide Web and the internet was growing, um, it was starting to grow at a reasonable rate, and you know, that's when the data protection directive was put in place. Uh, not long after that, the Data Protection Act was implemented, um, and you know this was really to make sure that they have a basic level of, of, of data protection in place. Not an awful lot happened until about 2003, and this is this is something that's really important actually because this this does not get talked about enough. Uh, it's going to be getting talked about a lot more over the next 12 months um, because it's really it's probably even more relevant than GDPR. Uh, and this is the Privacy Electronic Communications Regulate Directive Regulations. It's shortened to PECR. Now, this was put in place in 2003, and the reason the reason for this, um, especially in the UK, is to govern all digital communications. Now, that covers not only email and SMS, which are the two that tend to get talked about when it comes to PECR, but it also covers telephone and fax. Uh, the reason for those last two is because they are both transmitted over digital networks. Um, and you know, in terms of they, they can both be hacked essentially, and you know, can be they, they, follow, they need to follow the same sort of govern, governance as email and SMS. The, P, uh, the PECR have been updated four times since 2003, and the important piece is they're going to be updated again in 2019. Now, there's been quite a few examples of um, you know, well known companies being fined. Um, Honda is a, is a you know, one that seems to get repeated quite a lot. Very recently, Royal Mail were fined as well. Um, and this has all been, this come about because of GDPR. However, they were fined because they transgressed the PECR. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that was, um, because it's not often detailed as to what the actual the transgressions were. Uh, but like I say, it was PECR that they um, were fined under. Um, and, you know, with, them be, with that being updated next year, then you're going to get harder to send digital communications. So we all need to keep an eye on what's happening with PECR. The 25th of May is only the start of this journey uh, when GDPR kicks in. Um, there's going to be a lot more legislation and tightening of controls about what everyone can do. So I just wanted to talk about that as well. well that, last but not least, GDPR, the reason we're all here, happening this Friday, uh, in case anyone wasn't aware. Uh, there's just a little over one day to get everything else, get everything in place. Um, although, you know, like I say, the journey only starts on the 25th. There's plenty more to be done. Okay, so on to the handouts. So I did mention just a little while ago that, um, in actual fact, I've done a lot of research for GDPR uh, and PECR. Uh, I've read a lot of documents, a lot of websites. Um, there's some really good guidance out there. However, there's some not so good guidance as well. Um, I only try to stick to the official documents or as close to the official documents as possible. Um, two of which I've included in the handouts. One of which is this one. So this was a publication. It keeps getting updated. Um, the, the most recent one was in April. Uh, this is a direct marketing guidance as published by the ICO. So the ICO, if you don't not aware, is the governing body for GDPR and PECR and Data Protection Act. This document actually is a PECR document. However, what it does a great job of is including all three of those regulations in a single document. Um, it, it mainly is um, the first two, so the DPA and the PECR. However, what it does do is it inserts where the GDPR is going to change something with the two existing regulations. So the, the biggest one is how consent opt-ins are changing. Um, you know, where they're going to change from essentially what was an opt-out process to an opt-in process. Um, but well, I'll just detail that in a little bit more detail very shortly. 
So this is an excellent document. It's, it's my Bible. It's the one I refer to whenever I get asked questions because you can pretty much find all of the answers in here. The only thing it doesn't to go into too much detail on is, is legitimate interests. Uh, but there is another document which is in the handout that I'll take you through as well. Um, and between, to be honest, between those two documents, you've pretty much got direct marketing covered off. Um, some great guidance and some do's and don'ts in, in both of those documents. So that's there for you. I'm going to refer back to it and you'll see through the slides where I've actually taken an excerpt from one of those doc from either one of those documents. Uh, you'll see that it'll reference which page it's from, etc. And like I say, you can download this presentation and you know, use it for reference as well. Okay, so the first section we want to move into is the direct marketing piece. This is the hot topic, the one everyone's been talking about. It's the one that we get we get the most questions asked about uh, as to how, you know, which way, which route do we go down? Do we go down consent, legitimate interest? Do we start with legitimate interest and try to move to consent, which seems to be quite a popular one, if I'm honest. Um, but what I'd like to do um, is just, first of all, explain the difference. Uh, I'm sure most of you already know, but just if to just absolutely highlight what the difference is. In the, for the purpose of direct marketing, there's really two of the six reasons for using the customer's data apply. Uh, and like I say, there's these two, consent, legitimate interest. Consent is, um, from the 25th, what you're going to have to have is either uh, customer opt-in to, uh, to give you consent, or you will ha already have consent through something called soft opt-in. Now, we'll come to that in a little bit, what that means, but essentially what we're, what we're having there, whichever way, whichever way you have it, is um, some kind of positive action from the customer to say, you can use my, you know, my data for direct marketing. Uh, legitimate interest takes the opposite approach. So that's where the customer hasn't indicated the consent whatsoever. However, you as a business deem yourselves to have a legitimate interest to contact that customer for direct marketing purposes. Now, I'll go into the pros and cons in a little, little bit of the two, but um, you can already start to see that actually you're going to be writing to customers with that one um, and they weren't necessarily expecting you to write to them. And there's a really important line in the uh, legitimate interest guidance that um, you know that actually lets you understand what that really means. What do, it, would the customer be expecting what you've sent or not? So we're only going to do one poll in all, in, in the entire uh, webinar, but it's quite an important one. Um, I want to give you some uh, insight as to what we've seen from our own dealers already. What I'd like to do is just run a quick poll. Um, and ask you which route are you taking for direct marketing? Are you going to? Are you just going with consent and nothing else? Are you just going with legitimate interest? Are you going to try and have a hybrid of the two, where you use legitimate interest for some things and consent for others? Or at this point, even you know, with 20, less than 48 hours to go, have you still not decided? Um, so can we open the poll, please, guys? And just um, I'll give you about 30 seconds to put your answers in and then we'll just see what comes back. Okay, I'll give you about another 10 seconds and then we'll close the poll. Okay, so we've got the poll results there. Um, that is quite similar to what we've seen, actually. So you can see um, there's a small amount going for consent, um, a slightly larger amount going for legitimate interests. And, you know, the, the, the highest amount seems to be a mixture of the two. Uh, and there's a small amount, you know, single digits uh, are undecided. So. You know that is that is similar to what we've found with our own dealers. Uh, I thought it would be an interesting insight to see what people are going with on that. Um, what we found is um, about 11% of our own dealers have chosen to just use consent. 
for, a little bit higher, 48% of our dealers are actually going to use, to use just legitimate interest. We've got no interest in trying to use consent, send out things like service reminders, um, MOT reminders, Amber work follow-up, things like that. Um, however, you know, 41% of our dealers are actually going to do a mix. Um, and what I think people are going to do there, and what I think is the best option for most, is actually start using legitimate interest, but also capture consent alongside and build up your consent over time while continuing to send out you know, direct marketing using legitimate interest. So what that means is the world doesn't have to stop on the 25th, but um, you know, we can have a hybrid of the two. We can use legitimate interest to send out everything we currently send out. And you know, maybe in a year or two's time, once we've built up our consent database, we can probably switch off legitimate interest and just so then solely rely on consent. Now, some people just don't want to take the risk and just want to rely on consent. Others are happy to just rely on legitimate interest. There's no real um, you know, right or wrong at this moment in time. What I think is going to happen over time, though, is that people will lean more towards consent um, just because it is the safer option of the two. And, and that's certainly in my opinion. And I'll try to explain in the coming slides why I think that as well. OK, so what I'd like to do now is just run through the pros and consent of the, of the two. Uh, pros, pros and cons, sorry, of the two. Um, so in terms of consent, um, the pros for me are that you have greater flexibility in what you can use it for, because as you can see on the right, the customer doesn't have the object, the, uh, the right to object to something you send using consent, whereas they do with legitimate interest. They do have the right to withdraw consent, which is one of the cons, but you can pretty much send anything that you wish, uh, providing it's you know, within what you've stated you'll be sending in your privacy policy. That's also really important. Um, you've got much more flexibility when you're using consent for direct marketing. Um, like I said, there's no right to object, and there's very little risk in terms of that. Um, cons are clearly it can take quite a long time, a long time to obtain opt-in consent. It's probably going to take most dealers one to two years um, to get you know, the, the, the vast majority of the, the regular database opted into consent. Um, and like I said, it can be withdrawn at any time. Legitimate interest. Um, the real pro of that is you can use it immediately. So with consent, you've got to build it up. Legitimate interest. You can on the 25th, and like I say, a lot uh, about roughly about uh, 89, 90 percent of our dealers are going to be using legitimate interest to send out service reminders from the 25th. So you know they can do that because legitimate interest allow you to, to be use it straight away. Uh, you don't need consent either. Like we said, you know we do not need that. The cons for me though are when it becomes um, a bit of an issue of what you're sending and to who. So you are limited as to what you can use legitimate interest for. So you can't be using um, legitimate interest to send you know, all sorts of different marketing kind of campaigns to customers you haven't seen in a very long time, for example. It's written in there that they need, you have to prove that they would expect you to write to them. So if you're not seeing the customer for six years, for example, and you're not communicating to them in all that time, and you try to send them some kind of marketing offers, get them, win them back to the business, that's not going to stand up in terms of you know, something called the balancing test. It'd be very difficult for you to argue that a customer would ex have expected to receive that communication for you from you when you haven't you know, spoken to them in six years. So this is where legitimate interest, it has to be very measured. It's really only for existing or slightly lapsed customers. There is work involved to set it up. Um, now, what I mean by that is it's not just a case of writing in your privacy policy that you're going to be using legitimate interest. There's other measures you need in place. Uh, one of the most important things is the, the balancing test, which forms part of a legitimate interest assessment. And I'll, I'll show you how that, how that looks and where you can get more information on that very shortly. Um, there's also a risk of complaint if it's abused. So right, I think straight away, there's not going to be too much complaints regarding legitimate interest. However, as time moves on, people become more aware, and by people I mean the public, they become more aware of the fact that companies are using legitimate interest to write to them instead of consent. They may, over time, become more and more objections. And it's going to be quite difficult uh, and time-consuming to actually deal with those objections. And this is why I believe a lot of dealers actually want to move, move from using legitimate interest over to a world where we are all using consent. For me, that's the right way to go in the long term probably not the short to mid though. So that's the pros and cons um, very at a very high level. 
So what I want to just focus on for very quickly is answer some questions that we get asked quite a lot. Uh, me personally, I've had been asked these questions quite, uh, quite numerous times over the past couple of months. Uh, we'll focus on consent first. So one of the, one of the hottest questions is, is, is the existing consent good enough? Now, there's been quite a lot of publications um, from the likes of the ICO, but other governing bodies as well. Um, and I have put the source at the bottom. So you'll see there's an ICO, there's a recent ICO blog. If you Google it, it's called Raising the Bar um, Consent Under the GDPR. You'll see that this particular excerpt comes from that. What they're saying essentially is you may already have existing consent. Um, it's through something called soft opt-in, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the problem is whenever, whenever I've read, read up on this, there's some caveats to what they're saying. Um, the real um, crux of it is that when you originally capture the customer's data, did you give them an opt-out? Um, now, we all know that you know, when you sign up to a large company, maybe it's a phone provider like EE or someone like that, when you give them your data, they would have, without doubt, given you the ability to opt out of marketing at that point. Um, it may have been an opt-out box, or it may have been a pre-filled opt-out. It doesn't matter, they give you the opportunity. Um, you'll see at the bottom, I've put, put in, I've highlighted in bold, it says here, it's important to remember that in some cases it may not be appropriate to seek fresh consent if you're unsure how you collected the customer information in the first place. This is That statement, I think, is quite relevant to the motor industry because what we haven't done a particularly great job of um, traditionally is when we're capturing customers' data, usually in the showroom or on the phone when making a booking, we don't give the customer the option to opt out. And that's the bit I want to focus on in the next slide. Existing consent, have we already got some? I don't think we have, purely because of that particular comment. Um, it's all related to what's called a soft opt-in. Now, you'll find this in the direct marketing guide up on page 40, the one I've included in the handouts. Um, the, the term soft opt-in really comes from what I've just been talking about. So it's where you capture the data, uh, you gave them a chance to opt out when you captured it, and also in every communication since then, you should have also given them the ability to opt out as well. Now, I hand on heart from the, you know, the dealers I've worked in in the past can't say that we've done that in every case, and probably in many cases we just haven't offered those opt outs at those two key points. What that means is you probably haven't got soft opt in content. Um, for, for a good chunk of your database. There may be instances where you can prove you did do that, maybe on a new car sales order form, maybe on a website inquiry, but how are you gonna evidence which customers had that you know, options given to them and which didn't? I think it's gonna be very messy trying to prove uh, existing soft opt-in content. Um, which, that brings us to the next question I keep getting asked, can you send a, one-off email to all of your database asking them to update the consent preferences. Well, again, same direct marketing guide, that's why I keep referring back to it all the time because it's all the answers are in there. The very first line on this page says that organizations cannot email or text an individual to ask for consent to future marketing messages. Now this is kind of what Honda um, became, you know, had to, had to find for, is because they sent out an email to a lot of customers uh, and essentially what they couldn't evidence was that the customers had been given the ability to opt out when the data was first captured. Now there was a little bit actually because they were using dealer data and they were third parties, but the, 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 the essentially the same principle applies in that there was, not, there was no evidence that those customers that had been sent this email to update contact and content preferences had been, ever been given the ability to opt out. And because of that, they were fined under the PECR, not under the Data Protection Act. So this is why the PECR is really important. Um, and you'll see further down this page, it says, you know, the email that, that you send out asking for consent is actually a marketing email. So you, essentially you need consent to send the consent update email. It's a bit of, uh, you know, it's a bit chicken and egg, so you just can't do it. Uh, that's why it says in the direct marketing guide that, you know, you cannot send that email. So, you know, what does that leave? Well, really, that leaves capturing consent transactionally. Now, for us in the dealer network and you know, for the motor trade, what that means is, you know, every time we speak to a customer, we, if we want to be capturing consent, we need to ask the question. So we need to put some processes in place through both sales and service. Um, now, we have our own um, functionality that we provide to, um, you know, to our own dealers that use our software, called you know, something called iConsent, that allows them to embed content capture throughout in their daily processes. 
we've got some we've had some really good stats back already um, from the dealers that have been using it and what I was quite surprised you'll see by the infographic on the left is that 48% of customers actually still want to be contacted for direct marketing by mail and I was quite stunned at that I thought it was going to be in the low teens or single, even single digits but half of people still want to be written to by letter um, something else you'll see down the bottom 10% wanted no future contact now that's not complete opt-out so they, they were still happy to have service reminders and MOT reminders things like that but only 10% of people opted out for you know things like sales marketing and you know after sales marketing things like what we're winter campaigns what and other things like that um, so essentially 90% of people are still happy to be marketed to um, via opt-in content so that's quite encouraging I find um, and it's a real good reason for you know if you to go down the content route because when you start asking these are the kind of numbers that you that you see. Um, so in terms of actually, you know, well, how do you capture consent? Well, there's multiple avenues that you can do that. So whether that's through an online booking, a sales inquiry, service inquiry, um, making a service booking over the phone, or even you know when the customer walks in to check in for service, those are all these are all different great opportunities to capture consent. Now, what we've been able to pull is what is the split. So you can see there, um, a third of all the content we've been capturing through, throughout all these different processes has been through sales. However, two thirds have been captured through the various stages of um, customer interaction on after sales. So this kind of gives you an insight as to where you can embed um, content capture. Um, personally, I say you should try and capture it as, as, in as many places as you possibly can, but you know, the, this is what we're looking at in terms of the real world stats. When it comes to legitimate interest, I'm not going to get too bogged down in terms of, um, you know, how to do it. But what I wanted to show you in the handouts is that a really good guide um, that's just been updated. It's been published by a very trusted, trustworthy organization called the Data Protection Network, supported by many other organizations putting this data together. And what this tells you is how to do legitimate interest, essentially, how to do something called the balancing test uh, and also example legitimate interest assessments. Um, you, this may all be foreign language if you've not really looked into how to do legitimate interest up till now. But I, I wanted to know what's actually involved because it's not, you know, it wasn't too clear. So in this guide, there's things like flowcharts that you can follow as to, you know, should, you know, how do you actually apply a legitimate interest in practice? So this is a great flowchart to show you, you know, is it actually appropriate to use legitimate interest? Um, there's examples of legitimate interest assessment. Now, this is something like 29 questions that you need to do um, to actually apply legitimate interest to any particular piece of direct marketing you're going to do. Uh, you know, so that's things like reminders, uh, lapsed campaigns, sales marketing. You can use legitimate interest for all of those. You need to do these assessments to say, actually, would the customer expect to hear from me for this particular piece of direct marketing? Now, to, to be able to assess whether or not that's the case, you need to do this assessment and then keep it on record for any sort of future purposes because if a customer does object and does complain to the ICO first thing the ICO is going to ask you for is evidence that you did a legitimate interest assessment just to substantiate that you could send the direct marketing it's really important you do this uh, like I say I'm not going to go into great detail but the, the, I've attached the, um, the handout for you to take that away and have a look at it okay so Something that, again, it doesn't really get talked about an awful lot is um, respecting opt-outs. So it's been a lot of talk about opt-ins and uh, legitimate interest, but actually, what if a customer does object? What if they don't want you to send them anything, whether that's via consent or legitimate interest? If they completely opt out, how are you going to manage that? Now, you could delete their data from the database, but it could also be that the customer does, they're okay for you to have the data because they have existing contracts, maybe it's a service plan, finance agreement, something like that. So there's a reason for you to keep their data. They just don't want to hear from you at all unless it's you know, something to do with those particular contracts. So we need to be able to manage the opt-outs. Now, a real problem that we have in the motor trade is the way historically all the systems we use allow us to create multiple records for the same customer. So you know, I've just shown you a, this could be any DMS, uh, it could be any system in, in fact, because it's not just, this isn't just exclusive to DMS systems. But you could have the same customer in there three times with different email addresses, different addresses, different phone numbers that you've captured over time. Now, the problem is, and this is something that needs to be addressed quite quickly, is that 
you know, if we don't see duplicating the data, we could end up with different consent applied to different records, which is going to cause you a real problem when it comes to actually using that consent. And I'll just give you some examples here where we've got yeses and nos to different records or for different methods of communication. Now, that might not seem too much of an issue, especially and when we actually look at, um, you know, using consent to actually write you know, con contact customers. What we need to be able to do is just read the yeses. Now, it's better if we can merge these three records into one, and then we have a, a single record of yeses. So we know that for this address, this email, and that phone number, these are all the yeses. Um, what we don't want to have to be doing is writing to a customer or emailing or phoning a customer where you know we've got multiple records of consent and we've got to start interrogating well actually which one's the most up to date, which one has the right phone number. All of these things we need to really think about when in terms of you know processing marketing to these customers. However, the biggest problem is not for opt-in, but it's actually for opt-out. Imagine, so imagine we have all of these no's and we've got multiple records. What happens if we only look at one of the records when we do some marketing, but actually you'll see in these top two records, the same email address has a yes to email against one of them, but a no against the other one. If we use the wrong record, we could actually end up emailing a customer who's opted out by accident when because we looked at the wrong record so what we need to be doing and this is something we've we've addressed in you know through our own system as well is we need to be deduplicating these records and consolidating the consent especially for opt-outs so that we only have a single record for, for an opt-out and you'll see in this case this customer said no to everything however if we looked at the three records above we had to got some yeses so it's something to go away and think about. You need to make sure that you're managing your duplicate records, that you know, if you are getting customers wanting to opt out, that you certainly need to be making sure that they have um, not got duplicate records with different consent captures on there. It doesn't even have to be consent, actually, because if you rely on legitimate interest, the same would apply. If they opt out of even legitimate interest, you know, you need to make sure that those opt-outs are reflected in multiple records. So this isn't just about consent, it's about all opt-outs. Okay, so a couple more slides before we go to the Q&A. So if you're going for consent, something that we feel you need is some management information. Because what it's great capturing consent, but how do you know how much you've got? How do you know, you know, week on week, month on month, you know, are your capture rates going up, are they going down? Uh, is email, phone, SMS, post, which ones of those are actually you capturing most consent against? So you know when you go to marketing, you know, is it actually we've got, you know, 68% of customers have given us email consent, whereas only 48 have given us postal consent. So you're going to be able to understand which method of communication is going to be best for you know sending out you know, sending out marketing. So you need to have some kind of management information. This is just an example of what we have available in in iConsent, but you know you need to have that in place uh, to understand. You know you don't want to get a year or two down the line and realise actually I don't really have much in the way of consent against my entire database, and you're still then relying on legitimate interest. So please make sure that you have you know, con controls in place to maximize your captured consent. Uh, and then the other piece that, uh, you know, before we finish is um, compliance management. So all of these things are talked about. So your legitimate interest assessment, uh, you know, all these other things, you know, you need to have all this in, what, in, in, the same, in one place. Uh, this is an example of, of the tool we, we have in place for um, making sure that everything you need for GDPR, everything you need for PECR and also, you know, wherever else comes along the way we need to make sure we've got um, a single repository of all of that so you know it, god forbid if we do get investigated we can produce this information really quickly um, and the other important part is that we're actually reviewing this information on a regular basis and you know making sure it's up to date um, that is, is all really important uh, important things to do and uh, okay, so that's that's the summary of the webinar. Um, this is just the final slide that you'll see in the handout. It's just a little bit about a bit more about eye consent. Um, what I'd like to do though is uh, move across to the FAQ, and we can start to answer some questions. Fantastic! Thanks very much, Steve. Um, yeah, we've had a few few questions coming in, um, and obviously, audience, you can also take the next ten 
15 minutes or so to continue sending questions in. Um, the first one we've had in here, Steve, says, what about WhatsApp? No, nothing more than that, but obviously okay. somebody wants to know what the implications are for WhatsApp. Right, okay. I mean, a little bit more context would be great, but um, I suppose, is this for using WhatsApp in the showroom with customers? Um, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, we, we need to have both internal guidance for, for employees as to what, how they can use that to communicate with customers, as in what can and can't be sent. Um, I have, in one of my previous roles, um, in a consultancy role, worked with dealers where, for example, they were using WhatsApp to uh, ask the customer to send finance documents across. Um, and this is on their own personal mobile phones, which is, you know, in GDPR world, even in data protection world, I don't feel that's appropriate. You know, we shouldn't be holding financial documents from customers in our own WhatsApp on our own private personal phones. Um, so there's things like that that can come up in WhatsApp. I mean, WhatsApp itself does have its own opt-ins and, uh, you know, various data protection controls, but, you know, I think what we're going, where that question is aimed at is, you know, if staff are using WhatsApp to communicate with customers, personally, I'd say try to avoid it. Um, if you need to do it, you know, if you have a justifiable reason, then, you know, you need to have some, uh, your internal privacy policy for your staff, uh, that needs to be in place, uh, as well as, you know, being in your external privacy policy to customers as to why you would use WhatsApp and how that's, how the data in there is going to be used. Okay, thanks for that explanation, Steve. Uh, another one here, quite a long question. This um, in merging multiple customer records, where there are different answers given to one method of communication, mm -hmm. does the latest information given by the customer take precedence? What's your view on that? Uh, well, yes. Yeah. So, what there's two points to actually talk about here. So, this is this is one of the address the issues we've had to address. Um, some some records may not be dated, so uh, and do know that some DMS um, systems they don't have um, a, a time and date stamp as to when those content um, or opt outs were recorded. Now, if that's the case, if you haven't got evidence of a time and date stamp, I would say that that one is the one that has to take precedence because you can't prove it's an older consent record or an older opt out record. Um, one of the important pieces of GDPR with terms of caption consent and opt-outs is that you must record the time and date as to when they happened. Um, with historical data though, that's not the case. So if you're gonna be merging these dates, these records, um, hopefully you've got time and date stamps against all of them and you can use the re most recent one, in which case, yes, absolutely, that is, you know, use the most recent one. But if you've got no time and date stamp, unfortunately that's gonna to have to take precedence because you can't evidence that, you know, that is not, than uh, the the newest one. Okay, thank you. Um, the 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 question about WhatsApp has sent a bit of context. They have now said the context for WhatsApp was around electronic communications. Is it covered by PECR? Absolutely, yes, it is. Yeah, so PECR would also include instant messaging. Essentially, anything sent digitally, uh, like I said, even fax messages are covered by EPECR because it's sent over a digital network. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, we have one here. I think this is a systems question. Is I consent going to show in a tab on follow up the same as service plan? Yes, yeah, it does. Absolutely. Okay. Nice simple one, that one. Yep. Nice. <laughs> Quick answer to that one. All right. Uh, yeah. I, I, should, I should admit, I should actually add that I consent is uh, the, the, the subscription required, but you can email us on the inquiries um, email that you see in front of you. Okay, uh, another one just come in. We have our data protection notice available at all customer touch points. Should sales staff also be presenting the DPN before going into a sale, or will a visible DPN suffice? Um, the way it works, so I guess we're talking about here about the privacy policy, really. Um, what, what we should always do is make the customer aware that we have one at the appropriate time. Um, now. There's a, what you need to be aware of in terms of a uh, sales, con uh, a, a sale, you know, a, 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 when you're talking about selling a car, um, there's actually no consent required to communicate with the customer into, as long as the customer has instigated the inquiry. The reason for that is it's actually a transactional inquiry and you are allowed to continue to talk to the customer until they you know, tell you they can't, you can't, um, so you don't need any consent. 
the only time you'd need to start talking about privacy notices and things like that is when you start to go into a contractual agreement. So if you start talking about finance agreements, uh, service plan agreements, or anything like that, um, that's when you need to make them aware of you know, your, your, your data privacy notice, your, your privacy policies, things like that. Um, also, if you're going to start asking them about, um, you know, it can use their data for marketing, um, content, you know, all, all sorts of things like that. Again, you need to make them aware of it. You don't have to show them it, but if they ask, you need, it needs to be easily available. That's, that's, the, that's the guidance there. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, another couple of questions have just come in. Um, one here about um, legitimate, you talked about legitimate interests. Um, and suggested about starting with legitimate interest, but then capturing consent alongside it. Are there any risks mm-hmm. involved in in doing this? No, not at all. Um, the, the, I mean, there's, there's, it's, we've done a lot of uh, analysis over this, and you know, as as, a, as I said, and as you saw from the poll, a lot of dealers are going to choose that option. Um, what you need, I suppose, the risk would be that you don't manage it correctly. Um, this is, we, we've put a lot of time and effort into how our own follow-up module manages both legitimate interest and consent. Um, what you need to make sure is that as you transition, um, at some point you're going to want to switch off legitimate interest altogether once you've got enough consent. You just, all you need to have in place is whichever system you're using for um, sending out direct marketing, the, the most important piece is that you observe opt-outs. Um, customers can opt out of both consent and legitimate interest, as I said earlier. So you need to make sure you're observing those opt-outs. Uh, that's the first thing you do before you do anything else. Um, and, and then you look into uh, whether you're going to use legitimate interest or whether you're going to use consent. Um, you can't use this, both of them to send, send the same piece of communication to the same customer, but you could use legitimate interest to send the same communication to one customer the consent to a different customer. So that's um, that's where you need to just be aware. It's fine to use both. Um, you just need to have it documented when you're going to use either one um, and make sure the systems you're using can cope with transitioning between the two. Okay. And in requesting consent, presumably it completely makes sense for dealers to sell the benefits to the customer of giving, giving that consent, the fact that they'll be able to um, service their needs better in the future. Absolutely, yeah. And as I said earlier, the you know consent gives you greater flexibility in what you can send. Um, legitimate interest, you're going to have to be very measured, very reserved, uh, very restrained in what you actually send out and to who. Um, consent, as long as you keep you know regular communication with the customer, um, it's going to be absolutely fine to send them more than you can with legitimate interest. I mean, yeah, let's not. I'm not trying to say legitimate interest is going to really put the shackles on and stop you sending out. The regular communications you used to send, but it's certainly going to limit who you can send those to. Okay, thanks, Steve. Another question just come in. We've been asked by manufacturers and other parties we represent to get consent for them and update their system. On top of that, they're requesting quite a long-winded question for consent. How can we get around this? Uh, yeah, this is this is a tricky one. Uh, I, 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 because, because we deal with um, dealers that have pretty much every manufacturer brand that exists. Um, I've been part, I've been able to see various different requests from different manufacturers. Um, something that's tricky, and this is especially tricky for multi-franchise dealers who have you know certainly especially a number of different franchises. Um, the, the requests coming in from the brand vary quite wild, quite widely. Um, some are some have got different guidelines on how they think consent should be captured, what questions should be asked, how it should be categorised. I don't think you can get around it. Um, I think the what you need to observe is how you're going to capture consent, um, which is going to be governed really by the systems you use. So I've, to give you a real world example of that, uh, two of the biggest EMS systems um, in the, you know, the in, in the UK right now have different. Um, Content capture um, modules. In, what I mean by that is they capture content in different ways. Now, that instantly provides pro, 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 that instantly poses a problem when it comes to when you have the manufacturer saying, "Well, actually, we want you to capture it this way." The things aren't then compatible. So, what I'm really saying is, I think you're going to have to go with first and foremost the the method of content capture. So, if you're putting it in your DMS, 
you need to look at how the DMS con captures content. And then realistically, you're gonna have to talk to your brands, especially if you multi-franchise and say, look, this is the only way we can capture it. We can put in our um, privacy policy that we will capture content on behalf of the brand. So that's something you can put in there, nice and straightforward to do. And we recommend you make sure that's in there. Um, and also, you know, if the brand is asking you to update a separate system, then, you know, that is that is also observed. But, you know, it does become tricky. I, I can't offer any real world advice in terms of satisfying every brand because, unfortunately, I think in some cases it's been a little unfair on, on multi-franchise deals especially. Okay. Well, it's it's one of the, um, the challenges of being a multi-franchise group generally. They all have their own requirements and particular Absolutely. stipulations so um and i guess dealers are well well experienced with with managing that the best they can okay Absolutely. we've got last couple of questions then steve um should explicit opt-in consent be obtained before creating a contractual agreement or can opt-in be obtained once a sales order has been processed i.e to be signed with an order or prior to that Okay, so well, there's a couple of things to point out there, actually. So uh, if you're taking a sales order, there's actually no need to capture content whatsoever um, because what you're actually forming is a contract. Uh, and you know, moving forward, you don't have to send that customer direct marketing to fulfill the contract. You know, you may only, the customer may only wish, actually, to um, ever talk about the contract in terms of you know, what you communicate to them. Um, content is, a, is an optional thing. So the only reason you would actually want to ca capture consent from the customer is for you to communicate for them through via direct marketing. So that's to send them offers, um, send them you know, MOT reminders, service reminders. Those are all classes of direct marketing. Um, now I realize that the brands are asking you to capture content. Um, you, can, you can capture content at any point. It's completely separate from the contract itself. Um, this is where you need to understand that um, there's actually six reasons for, for communicating with customers under GDPR. Contractual obligations is one, and it does that has nothing to do with direct marketing. The, the two, the two for direct marketing are consent and legitimate interest, and like I say, they sit outside of it. In terms of when is best in the process, that's entirely up to you. Um, if it was me, I'd probably try and ask when the inquiry first comes in. Uh, there's no harm in asking further down the process as well. Um, you know, what you need to make sure is you're not asking the customer repeatedly. You need to have some method of being able to say, well, actually, we only asked this customer last week. They didn't want to give us content then, so I'm not going to ask again now. Okay, fantastic. And final question then, Steve, is um, what are your views on customers' data with regard to part exchanges and passing on their details within the service history? More, I guess, on rather than the marketing side, just on dealing, processing with, with personal data. What's your view on, on that? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, to be honest, this isn't new information. This is all, it's already exists under the old data protection act, uh, in that when you, when, let's say a customer comes in for a service and you raise an invoice, um, for the services they purchased. So let's just say it's a straightforward service. That, that particular transaction belongs to that customer. Now, the fact the transaction occurred goes in the service book, but all that goes in there is the date and the mileage. There's no customer data actually goes in the service book. The invoice belongs to the customer. Now, that, that has always been the case. Um, what you shouldn't do, so let's say you get a part exchange, um, what you shouldn't do is be passing on um, invoices or anything with the previous owner's personal data on, on it that should not be passed on to the new owner. So they shouldn't be given um, evidence of invoice, uh, evidence of servicing by, by way of an invoice, especially if it's got customer data on. Uh, so none of that is going to change. Uh, something that has been raised with GDPR especially is actually things like sat-nav systems holding onto the previous customer's data. So we need to make sure that as part of the use vehicle preparation processes, technicians are aware they need to be um, restoring things like sat-navs to, to factory settings. Um, and any, any other infotainment systems in the in the vehicle need to be completely reset to you know the original settings. We need to make sure that we just do not pass anything other than service history and MOT history onto the new owner. 
Okay, fantastic. I think that that was a, a view that was also shared at, back at our um, GDPR conference in um, February as well, that um, certainly dealers should be either getting the customer to delete their in personal information from the car's history, the sat-nav history, before they handed the car in, or at least informing the customer that they they would be. And I guess really, really as a, as a as a customer buying the car, I mean, you don't want to see the details of the previous owner's address or anything in there either, will you? So no, I, I, mean, I don't. Know what, yeah, what what the last on the final thing on that? The only thing I'm not sure about is what what is. Um, the BBSA going to do in terms of the B5C registration document? Are they going to continue to share the previous owner's name and address? Um, I'm not up to speed with that particular element, but it would be interesting to, interesting to see how that pans out. Mm, certainly, certainly. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. I'd, li I'd like to say thank you to Steve here from eDynamics for today's presentation. Um, You're welcome. Certainly by the, the number of questions that we've we've had, it's given given our viewers plenty to, to think about. Um, and if anybody wishes to view it again, it will be published on AM Online. Um, so thank you also to the audience for joining us today and taking an interest in GDPR. It's not long now till it comes in and I'm sure most of you are well along the, the journey um, and do please keep an eye on AM online and your daily email newsletters for details of more webinars we'll be running in the future on other subjects too thank you very much everyone goodbye goodbye now